It's just a fantastic thing that we have the privilege of taking direct instructions from our Father whereby we know how to be blessed. And that's what this is about. But many people say, well, the law is bad. No, it isn't. People are. And the law is good in as much as it tells you how to stay out of trouble. It's, is it possible that man can follow the law to the letter? Probably not. At least no one ever has except Christ himself. So it still keeps you out of trouble. But the most important thing, it tells you how to be blessed of God. And that is so very important because from that comes peace of mind, prosperity, and happiness. And life on this earth age without happiness is a tough old ticket. So this is how you find it. It will change your life by following his instructions. He knows what makes these things bodies tick. Now we have covered briefly in the last couple of lectures the food laws, which tells us how to be healthy. Uh, and I think that uh, we, we discussed the animals that we could partake of. And at the close of the animals you could partake of, God instructed that you should never uh, seethe or boil a kid in its mother's milk. And, and within that, that's just kind of double jeopardy. You know, you just don't do that. That adds salt to the wound or, or just, you see within that God's compassion for animals. There's really no other way to figure it. Sure, it's a figure of speech, but at the same time, you see his compassion for the little creatures that he created that sustain us. And a person that's been around agriculture and won't take care of his animals, uh, God won't bless him either. They're God's creation, and uh, we are to take care of them. He put them in the charge of man. That is to, to say those that he will not accept as a sacrifice, such as a deer, why? You can't sacrifice something God has raised. Okay, enough said on that subject. Now we get back into some of the laws of servitude among men. Chapter 14, 15, rather, chapter 15, verse 12. Let's pick it up. Let's go with it. And if thy brother, an Hebrew man, this word Hebrew comes from the word Eber, which is to say those that cross the river, from across the river, Eber, it, it means um, when, uh, when Abraham and others crossed uh, the Euphrates. Or an Hebrew woman be sold unto thee. That means into slavery. And serve thee six years. Then in the seventh year thou shalt uh, let him go free from thee. Now that doesn't mean that you're to hold them in captivity or in servitude until the next sabbatical year comes by. That means after seven years of, uh, after six years, rather, of servitude, the seventh year, they're free, whether it's a sabbatical year or not. At the time of this writing, it was not um, uh, unusual for a family to fall on hard luck, and they might put their children up as... Um, as uh, marks or as uh, into servitude to pay a debt to keep some family member from going to prison. Uh, that's through down through the years, slavery is not a good thing. But yet, at the same time, God's law takes care of even a slave for one that goes by God's word. Even a slave has rights and privileges in God's word. Six years, you're out of here. You're free. And uh, there were certain laws that took care of slavery. You were to pay us. Well, we'll, 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 let's cover it verse by verse here. Let God do the speaking. 13. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty, him or her. In other words, you will share the blessings of God or quite frankly, you won't have any more blessings necessarily until you repent. God expects us to share our blessings with those who earn them. Those that don't earn them, hey, you know, you don't think after six years they deserve a blessing? If they've been good servants, of course they do. 
That's only right. And what God is saying, it won't cost you anything really because I'm going to bless you anyway. Verse 14. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor, that means the grain floor, and out of thy wine press of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Thou shalt give unto him. And that's the way God operates. They, when it's earned, then heap it on. Verse 15. And thou shalt remember that thou was a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore, I command thee this thing today. And it still goes to this day. Our forefathers were in bondage for 400 years. What? For a lesson. For one thing, to teach and to prove a point. When God would choose certain people to uh, be a, a privileged, I don't like the word privileged, to be a treasure to him, he wanted them to know coming out the gate, hey, I don't play favorites into bondage, and into bondage they went. But naturally, they came out far richer than they went in. So it's a numbling thing. And there's nothing wrong with servitude, good, honest servitude. That you that have jobs and professions, you work. It's healthy. And that's the way God intended it. Uh, but never forget to uh, observe and make sure that one has his due. And God says, if you do it liberally, I'll, I'll give you more. Verse 16. And it shall be. If he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee because he loveth thee in thine house, because he is well with thee. Meaning, um, he likes his position there well enough. He doesn't want to leave it. He wants to stay with it. And he loves being with the overall family. He doesn't want to go. He doesn't want his freedom. I, I, this, this is something, a, a good family relationship, a good working relationship, do, uh, Christianity uh, pours out all over it. So that may offend some, but be that as it may, it does with any religion as long as the man uh, or woman who heads the rancho is a person that is fair and just. People simply like fairness, and they like that that is just. Seventeen. Then thou shalt take an awl and thrust it through his ear unto the door, and he shall be thy servant forever. And also unto thy maidservant thou shalt do likewise. Now, this, of course, has been fulfilled. There's that, that would create, even though it wasn't uh, like a, an awl you would put a cable together with, it'd be very small but it was bloodletting. Blood We're not allowed to let blood on our doorpost. This made them, basically, the idea was blood family or family blood to the doorpost, the doorpost of the tribe, the house. There was one that was nailed to the post, the cross, and he shed his blood for one and all times. And when you believe upon him, you become now a part of that family. And do I think that this was symbolic or a forerunner, a type? Yes, I do. God has a reason and a purpose for everything that he propounded in within the law. And just look forward to that time. Two threes and a seven. You know, God works on a perfect timetable, and man needs to pay heed to that timetable, uh, this looking forward. But it is, um, it may not be as unusual as you might think in days of slavery even in this country, and this, this may offend some, I, but this would happen. Some people loved their setting and their positions enough that uh, they didn't want to leave, and they were paid well. Some t cases, they were not. And that's real sad. However, the important thing, God knows. 
God blesses and God takes away. He's the equalizer. Verse 18, the judge. 18 reads, It shall not seem hard unto thee when thou sendest him away free from thee, for he hath been worth a double hired servant to thee in serving thee six years, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all that thou doest. And naturally, what, what this means is that he was a slave and, and a hired servant just works days. And someone that becomes a part of the family works night and day, basically. So they have more coming. And he said, after all, with the service they have given, don't feel bad about sharing what you have. And the deeper truth is that God always sees that you receive more than you share to those that deserve it. And I want to repeat, to those that deserve it. You have a certain class of people that can put on religious collars or just feel they're kind of special and feel the world owes them a living. It doesn't. A person is only worth their hire. Uh, freeloaders I do not like, will not tolerate, do not wish them to be around me, and I'm not talking again, I want to reiterate, this does not apply to handicapped people. Handicapped people, we are responsible and we take care of our own. That's why we have the systems that we have that your tax tithe goes to pay for. That is to say, even with our present day government, in as much as I explained before, the Levitical priesthood was the law at this time. It was the Levitical priesthood in as much as it was God's government that paid the widow, the handicapped, and so forth, took care of them. And that taxation of tithe, even to this day, still does. The mark of God's law, in as much as our Constitution came from this Word of God, uh, God pretty well takes care of His people from beginning to end. So the blessings flow, and someone that is that loyal and works that hard don't feel bad about it. But why? Because God's going to overbless you anyway if you do it liberally. That means willingly. God will bless you all the more. Verse 19, all the firstling males that come of thy herd and of thy flock, thou shalt sanctify unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work with the firstling of the bullock. You're not, don't put a yoke on him nor share, share the firstling of thy sheep. You don't, don't take the wool off of them. Why? They belong to God. The first fruits belong to God. Now, the lesson I want you to see within this, we, we do not do animal sacrifice any longer. All right, so we, God, does, God has told you, instructed you, I want your love. I don't, I don't want your burnt offerings didn't from the beginning. It was just a lesson to you in sacrificing them. And in this case, as you know, God shares this food with even the people whereby they rejoice and are happy at the reading of the law each year at the three times in which they met. Verse 20, Thou shalt eat it before the Lord thy God year by year in the place which the Lord shall choose. Again, this is important, beloved. You must eat it where the Lord shall choose. Thou and thy household. Um, the Great Commission naturally takes this place, the spreading of the good news, the gospel. But it's got to be where the Lord placed his name. And I'll, we'll get to that in just a few moments here. 21. And if there be any blemish therein, as if it be lame, or blind, or have any ill blemish, thou shalt not sacrifice it unto the Lord thy God. Why? Because Christ, the ultimate sacrifice, had to be perfect. 
And though God, did this mean that the handicapped were put on the waste heap? No, listen, 22. I want you to see God's compassion, though this may be a far stretch for some. Thou shalt eat it within thy gates. You keep it where you are. Don't take it to the Lord's house. The unclean and the clean person shall eat it alike, as the roebuck and as the heart. Eat it like what? Not as a sacrifice, but why? You couldn't sacrifice a roebuck, that's a deer, um, or the heart being a deer. Why? Because it's God's animal. He raised them. They're wild. You hunt them and take them. They're God's property. So you can't turn around and give God something he owns already. And that's almost laughable when you understand that God owns everything anyway, even you. Ezekiel 18.4 all souls belong to God. It isn't your soul to give him willingly on your part. He already owns it. And it's his to send to the lake of fire if he so chooses. It's, it's your decision that causes uh, he to make his decision. So, uh, this is to be partaken of in your own home, family. 23. Only thou shalt not eat the blood thereof, thou shalt pour it upon the ground as water. Why? Because you would never eat something that died of itself why it wasn't bled properly. Something was wrong. And you do not, many people claim that we do sacrificial butchering still to this day. That's really not true. I don't, like, I don't think it's sacrificial when you simply bleed an animal before you partake of it as food, it's God's law. Now, what did it mean, the unclean and the clean? Now, a lot of people think, oh, you're not supposed to judge between the animals anymore when you eat the clean. It's not talking about animals. It's talking about men, women, children. Example, had you touched a dead body, you would not be allowed to be called clean for a period of time. But he says, in this case, let the unclean partake of it also. Why? It isn't a religious eating. It isn't a religious feast. And he wanted to drive that nail home. But don't waste it. Don't waste them. Just because it's handicapped, don't throw it out use it. Now, uh, what does this mean among people? As I said, it's a, it's a hard stretch for some, <clears throat> and some tender-hearted soul might be offended. But God finds a use for everyone. I know handicapped people that have more faith than someone that's healthy. Why? Well, I suppose they love the Lord more. And if God put that thorn upon them, they bear it well and they make a better example for God and a better testimony than a healthy person. So understand the compassion and the love of your Father as he sets forth these ways of life and the compassion and thought that you should have within because it is a type that gives you better understanding of both the cruci crucifixion and God's love for you. <clears throat> okay, chapter 16, verse 1. We're going to change the subject a little bit. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover until the Lord, unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of, of Egypt by night. Now, this will be one of the few times that Abib is used... Uh, um, because it is a foreign name, it will be replaced by niacin uh, in further months as we get into it. Uh, many people still don't know how to count a calendar. He said, you keep the Passover. Why? The death angel is still out there. All right? And uh, the wickedness of the world, the Passover gives you a pass that causes the evil to pass over you if you understand it. I feel that inasmuch as God spoke these words, we must go by God's calendar, which is the solar calendar, of course. Why? Passover happens the exact same time every year. 
because Abib begins in the new year. And the new year begins at the spring equinox. And 14 days later at sundown, I repeat, at sundown on the fourth day, 14th day, which starts the 15th, is Passover, and it should be celebrated at that time every year. Uh, it is basically by this chapel as, as um, much as it can be expected. Where does God place his name? Well, what became your Passover? That's what's important. I want you to turn with me to um, the New Testament, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I, I, I don't ever want you to forget what our Passover is, what it has become, whereby you never forget Therefore, you will learn within this Passover where God placed his name, whereas you, where, whereas you are supposed to partake of Passover at that place where God has placed his name. That's important. Chapter 5, 1 Corinthians, verse, let's go with verse 7. And verse 7 reads, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Leaven is symbolic of sin. You get rid of it. That you may be a new lump. That's speaking of your clay body. As ye are unleavened, meaning uh, without sin, when you repent, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Those are powerful words. I want to say it again. For even Christ, do you know what Christ means? It's Christos, the anointed one, the Messiah. Our Passover, our reason that evil passes over us, the reason the death angel must pass over us, the reason Satan must pass over you and your family, as long as they are within your gates, he is sacrificed. He was sacrificed on the cross for us. Verse 8, therefore, let us keep the feast, and it should be kept. The feast became the holy sacrament. Not with old leaven, not necessarily the old way, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. It's a time of beauty. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. People will worry about a crumb of bread. And um, they'll cleanse yeast from their house from front to the back. But the sincerity of truth they do not partake of, and they let sin, which leaven symbolizes, pour into their house through television, through stories, through this, through that, in thousands of ways, and think they've kept the Passover. You haven't kept the Passover that way. In sincerity and truth, understanding that Christ has become the sacrificial lamb that was slain, the lamb slain for you, whereby you, with that sacrificial offering to God, upon saying, Father, I have a change of heart and I repent, you're washed white as snow. You're clean. The greatest gift that can be given to man. Where do you take this Passover? In Christ. Christ became our Passover. What is his name? Yeshua. When you say Jesus, uh, you're saying Yeshua which is to say, Yahweh, there's where he put his name. Don't ever forget it. Yahweh's Savior, our Savior, God's Savior. That's where God put his name, and that is where you will take the Passover and in no other place. I think that makes it pretty plain. For quite frankly... There is no other Passover at this time, for the lamb has already been slain. If you look for another, you'll find one. He's coming. He's a fake. 
He is none other than the reigning source of the, of the death angel. You ready for him? He's coming to play Jesus for those that wait a little late. His message will be, I've come to rapture you away for those that are unlearned. And they're geared for it. They've already got the mark in their mind. They're going to jump on his buggy. And even though Christ time after time repeated, the first Messiah that comes will be the Antichrist, they still want to believe the flyaway doctrine, contrary to the Word of God. Those that choose to be deceived, let them be deceived still. Returning to chapter 16, the great book of Deuteronomy, may I ask, do you know where to take Passover, where God has chosen? He said, don't take it unless I've chosen the place. If it's too far, sell what you have, and that is to say you're offering and rebuy when you get there. Look, he's made it so convenient that you don't have to go that far. Some of you do, for we all take Passover together. And, may, and it is always a blessed event. Returning to chapter 16, Deuteronomy, verse 2. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock uh, and the um, of the flock and the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Yeshua. He became our Passover. God placed his name there. He named him. What did he say to call him in a, in a way that perhaps it's a little easier for some to understand with, that are not familiar with the Hebrew tongue and Yahweh and Yeshua? He said, call him Emmanuel. God is there. His name is there. That's where you take it. Christ became your Passover with all of the signification and all the shadow of teachings that the law being the schoolmaster thereof came to fulfillment on that cross. And if you ever need a, a brush up on it, check out Hebrews chapter 10 in the New Testament and rejoice. Beloved, it, is, it may seem a small thing to you, but it's a big thing to our Father for you to partake of Passover, whether it be in your own home, but make sure that the Passover is where God placed his name, that is to say in Yeshua, Jesus, who became our Passover, as we just reiterated, as we read, for it is written. And you, know, you don't have to go to the New Testament. That was of old. It is written in the book of Daniel that the daily offering would be taken away, sacrificed. Christ took it away by becoming the chief sacrifice for one and all times. Verse 3 reads, Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. In other words, yeast you put into, or leaven if you choose, you put into the dough and you work it and you pat it and you knead it and, and then it's got to sit for quite a spell and it rises and oh man, it tastes so good, but it takes time. And what God is telling you, you don't have time when it comes to accepting Christ. You don't have time to wait for the bread to rise. You eat the unleavened cake and uh, be ready to move, of course, to your freedom or to serve God, both, but primarily to their freedom. Serving God is to your freedom. Verse 4, And there shall be no leavened bread seen with thee in all thy coast seven days. Neither shall there anything of the flesh which thou sacrificest the first day at even. 
remain all night until the morning. You only take what you need. You be ready to travel. Five, thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Can't take it there. Why? You've got to take it where God placed his name. He made that clear, did he not? Back in verse 2, 6. But at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in, in Yahshua, there thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even, at the going down of the sun, at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. It's all symbolic. But oh, what a price for freedom. Verse 7, And thou shalt roast and eat it in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt turn in the morning and go into thy tents. Didn't mean their houses, booths. This would kind of be what the, uh, if you've seen the great picture of the Last Supper, uh, if you make a deeper study, you'll understand the last verse. I think I choose not to go any deeper into it at this time for at risk of uh, confusing. Verse 8, six days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord thy God, Thou shalt do no work therein. What, what is six and seven? We're coming to that time where uh, what is a day with the Lord? A day with the Lord is a thousand years. And we have had how many days with the Lord? I said again, Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Be not ignorant of this thing, it is written, for one day with the Lord is as a thousand years is to man. We've had those six days, my friend, roughly, approximately. And we're coming up on the seventh, which means we will have a sabbatical millennium. That's what 2000 begins. Not the millennium. Please listen to me carefully. Do not confuse yourself. I did not say that in the year 2000 the millennium begins. I said a span of time, meaning we begin a 7,000-year period. We're completing a 6,000-year period, the seven, and that being seven days with God. In as much as 1,000 years is one day, the Lord's day. We begin that time so you can expect to see some very interesting things begin to transpire as far as men on earth and how they act and react and really, quite frankly, how little the majority know about our Father's plan. Now, when we pick up in the next lectures, and thus I'm going to stop at this point because we're going to be going into the, the, the Feast of Pentecost, and um, we'll start that fresh in the next lecture, telling you exactly when Pentecost would be figuring it from Passover. Okay, so there you have it. These things are very important to Father. Why? Well, Emmanuel, God with us, there's not many God with us that would die on the cross for you, for there was only one, and he was crucified not because he could not prevent, have prevented it, but because he chose to place his name there. He chose to become our Passover, our way out. As the children of Israel found the way out of Egypt, you find the way out of um, sin, conviction, Satan's grasp into a happy blissful, wonderful eternity. He is the door. He is the shepherd that counts the sheep as they go into that door, the chief shepherd. So see that you understand where God placed his name. 
understand the sacred name. Many might say, well, why do you use all the names? Because I'm a teacher, and I must teach people that only know certain names and break that into that beautiful sacred name whereby they are educated. Otherwise, I could be like a lot of fruitcakes that misspell the correct spelling of the great name because of their ignorance of the manuscripts, but I, I don't want to call them ignorant. They, at least they try, but they make a religion. A little bit of knowledge can become a dangerous thing to some people, and I am criticized by some of them for not using the sacred name all the time. But how else could I teach someone that knew not the manuscripts, the sacred name, if I did not use the common denominator, which they call to bleed into that. So what a wonderful time Passover is. We just completed a Passover, and what a beautiful time it was. I think we baptized 270 or something, I can't remember, souls into the service of the king. What a beautiful time. 